Well, some of you may not uh, uh, know Dr. Young, and uh, I just want to introduce him to you. Um, Dr. Mark Young is the uh, president of Denver uh, Theological Seminary. Uh, before that, he was a professor of world missions and intercultural studies here uh, for 13 years. And uh, before that, uh, he was with World Venture uh, for, for 14 years in uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, his wife, uh, Priscilla, is here with us, uh, if you could wave. And uh, it's, it's a privilege for us to have him come back and uh, minister to us. And uh, wouldn't it be exciting if at the end of the day, what we really heard was God's voice speaking? Let's pray that that would happen. So we made a little adjustment to the stage today. Whoa. Number one, this, this is higher. Yesterday I was thinking, I know I have notes down there somewhere. And, and I have so much to say today, I have two stands. I, I hope that you, like me, are in wonder at what God does when the people of God gather and focus their hearts and their minds on Him. Thank you for that. Where else do we experience that? There is nowhere else where people come together with such singleness of heart and singleness of purpose and singleness of thought on someone else rather than themselves. And so when the people of God gather, they learn to adore their God. We will not commend a God to the world that we do not adore. And so we, again, say thank you for what you've done with us this morning. This week, we're looking at the whole question of abundance. And as I mentioned yesterday, I was so pleased when I got the information that the theme of the conference has to do with mission as an expression of this abundant life that is ours in Christ. Yesterday, we, we looked at the question of this gospel of abundance that we have the privilege of living out. And today, I want us to pay attention to the Christ of abundance. We began the whole conversation yesterday looking at this passage of Scripture in John 10, from which this idea of the abundant life flows. Let me read it to you again. Therefore, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. Or as the New King James says, have it more abundantly. And yesterday we reflected on the idea that because of this verse, particularly this one verse, that there's this idea of Jesus giving life and then giving abundant life, that in the churches that you and I are a part of, we, we often hear teaching that seems to indicate that somehow this abundant life is different than the life that Christ has given us that somehow there's a two-step process whereby we experience this abundant life. Uh, some call it the deeper life, some the victorious life, some call it the second work of the Spirit. This theme in theology goes well back into our history, and some of the theological roots that you and I are enjoying in this context flow out of some teaching that taught that there was a deeper Christian life, a more abundant life, a more victorious life that somehow is the second work of grace in our lives. It seems to me that this idea of this deeper life, this victorious life, this more abundant life really was an attempt to address the question of nominalism among Christians. Those who had believed in the gospel felt that their ticket to heaven was punched and so that was the end of it. And they began to live as if nothing had ever happened to them or nothing was changed in their lives. And so then came this idea, well, there's got to be more. So there's another secret to a happy Christian life or there's another secret to this victorious or deeper life. 
And yesterday I postulated that perhaps, in our tradition anyway, this problem of trying to understand is there a deeper life than that which we have in Christ is really an expression of a much more deeply embedded, much more serious problem that we called two-gospel Christianity. This two-gospel Christianity postulates that there's the gospel of the cross as enunciated in 1 Corinthians 15 and that there's the gospel of the kingdom as enunciated in Mark chapter 1. And in this two-gospel Christianity, we've seen two very distinct streams of Christian expression emerge in our place in North America. On the one hand, there were those who promulgated this otherworldly gospel, this gospel of the cross that allowed us to be saved from this world that was my get-out-of-here salvation kind of gospel. And the other side of the equation was a gospel that said, no, the gospel is about changing this world that we are in socially and relationally and economically. One taught, one quickly became the gospel of personal benefit and the other quickly became the gospel of social benefit. These two gospels, it seems to me, and the tension between them has been at the root of much of the reason that the presence of Christianity continues to diminish and lose influence in our culture. On our side of the equation, this gospel, this otherworldly gospel that is only my get-out-of-jail-free card has led to an awareness, has led to a, an emptiness, has led to a shallowness of what it means to be someone who is a person of the gospel. And so we proposed yesterday that there is one gospel. It is the good news of God, the announcement that through the death and resurrection of the promised one, there is now life, full and abundant life lived as God created it to be lived eternal life lived now. This gospel announces that the Messiah has defeated evil and sin and death. This one gospel brings you and me into relationship with the very giver of life. And so the abundant life, we argued, is the gospel life. Life lived in the very purpose and mission of God. Life lived with a commission to participate in God's rule over all creation, to live life, to announce life, to bring life full and abundant in the midst of a world that is dying, trapped in evil, suffering, and dead. The abundant life, we're arguing, is the way of mission, the God-ordained means whereby His people live out His reign, announce His victory, and bring the hope of life to the spiritually dead, the blind, the deceived, the hungry, the enslaved, and the hopeless. <laughs> That's a life I want to live. But none of this makes sense. None of it makes sense unless our vision of Christ, our vision of the Savior, our vision of the object of this gospel is as much as the portrait that is printed of Him in all the pages of Scripture. And therein lies a problem. For it seems to me that for many of us, we have believed in a diminished Jesus. For many of us, quite frankly, Jesus isn't enough. This question, is Jesus enough, is one that Priscilla and I were asking one another last fall. It was a question that I began to, to ask during the last academic year when I was using the 1 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ compels us from the life of Paul as a theme that I preached on and talked about in all the chapels that I did at Denver Seminary. And so I kept asking myself the question, is Jesus enough for me? 
Do I have such a vision of the risen risen Christ that this compulsion comes not because of my own courage or my own desire to see others experience life, but because of who He is? Is Jesus enough to compel us to live out this life, to announce this life, to bring this life in Christ in this dying world? And then… God gave us the privilege to go to Urbana this past year, the first time in all of our years of ministry that we'd been to Urbana. It was a wonderful inclusio for Priscilla and me because her dad had gone to the second Urbana in the early 1950s, and at that Urbana, he had committed his life as a doctor to service for Christ. And so we go back. And there we are with 16,000 of our closest friends, uh, enjoying this incredible enthusiasm, this wonderful commitment to the Word of God, this, this, this focus upon God using us in the world. And out walks this young preacher by the name of David Platt. I, never, I, I didn't know David Platt. I'd never heard him speak. Uh, evidently, I was the only person in America that hadn't read any of his books. And he began to preach, and he asked the same question that Priscilla and I had been asking, is Jesus enough? And so what I'd like for you, what I'd like to share with you this morning is our answer to that question, is Jesus enough? I'd like to start our consideration in Luke's gospel, so if you would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. I make, I make no bones about it. I'm, I am completely fascinated by this one in the pages of the New Testament known as Peter. What I love most about my study of Peter through the years is that Peter gets it sometimes and sometimes he doesn't get it at all. The reason I like that is because that's where most of my life has lived. In Luke chapter 5, before we get to the story I want to pay attention to, we, we come into this er, these early days in the life of Jesus. Uh, Luke has laid out so clearly for us as readers looking back into Jesus' life how clear it is that Jesus is the Son of God. Through the birth narrative, through the baptism story, through the testing in the wilderness, and then in Luke chapter 4. Luke tells us that Jesus comes back into Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about Him spread through the whole countryside. It's been interesting to talk with students through the years about what does it mean that Jesus came into Galilee in the power of the Spirit? And it's interesting because most of us in this particular context typically don't want to think about what the word power normally means in Luke's writing. Of all the times that Luke uses the word power, the most frequent use of the word means a visible manifestation of the presence of God, signs and wonders and miracles. And so, Jesus comes back into Galilee doing these miracles, and the news about Him spreads throughout Galilee. Now, when you read the New Testament, here's what I want you to always remember. Never, never, ever see Jesus encountering someone in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, who doesn't have some clue about Him already. Gossip was the first century internet. (laughs) And so the word about Him spreads throughout Galilee. And so everywhere Jesus goes, His reputation precedes Him. Now, certainly first century people were more pious than we are, but the typical human expression of gossip is to take a story and do what with it? Embellish it a little bit. So you can just hear it. Well, you know, I I saw Jesus heal this guy that couldn't walk. That's nothing. I saw Jesus heal a guy that couldn't walk and cause him to see all at the same time. That's nothing. I saw Jesus raise a man from the dead. Oh, that's nothing. I saw Jesus fly from tree to tree. 
You can imagine the stories that come up. And so Jesus then goes into his hometown and he announces to them by reading from, Luke cha or from Isaiah chapter 61 and Isaiah chapter 58 that the kingdom is today in place known as the year of the Lord's favor, that time when in fact everything that was wrong in the world would be made right and everything that was broken in the world would be made whole and everything that was beautiful in the world, ugly in the world would be made beautiful. It's today, he says. And then they say to him, yes, this is Joseph's son. Yes. He grew up here. Yes, we wiped his nose. Yes, surely what we've heard that he's been doing throughout Galilee, he's going to do here. Yes. And then he tells them this cockamamie story about how God decided to heal a Gentile when there were lots of Jews that had leprosy and how God decided to feed a Gentile when there were lots of people in Israel who were starving to death. That's not what they wanted to hear, and they tried to kill him. And then we read about how Jesus goes on and He continues to live out these signs of the kingdom, of the presence of God. We get down to verse 38 of chapter 4, and we read, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. In the wisdom of God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures do not tell us whether Peter was pleased with this miracle. <laughs> We're going to assume that he was. And now comes the story that I want us to focus upon. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around Him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, did you notice how I read that story? So peaceful. Jesus was walking along the shore, and there were people there, and he saw these boats on the lake and decided he'd get in the boat and start teaching. That's not what happened. What I need you to see is people desperate for a miracle. People who've heard about what Jesus has done. People who've never heard of monochronic time, which is the way you and I line up at a store to buy things. People whose whole culture for centuries has been polychronic time, which means that everybody tries to do something at the same time. People rushing and moving and pressing upon Jesus, seeking this miracle, like the woman who reaches out and touches Him in the crowd. People wanting what they think Jesus has to offer them, seeking relief and release from what is oppressing them. I think they pushed Him and pressed upon Him, and Jesus steps into that boat because if He doesn't, they're going to push Him right into the lake. And he teaches. What did he teach about? It's interesting, isn't it? When we go back and we wonder, was he kind of doing this whole Trinitarian thing? Or, you know, what was he teaching about? What do you think? Based on the rest of the testimony of the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus, what do you think Jesus was teaching about? The kingdom of God. That God is doing something new. That God is present in a way He's never been present before. And of course, surely Simon and the others, they'd heard the rabbis talk about the kingdom of God. They've been talking about it for 400 years. And this, this rabbi, now he's talking about the kingdom of God, but he's got street cred because he just healed Simon's mother-in-law. And so he's listening. 
In the one ear, he's got the whole thing of rabbi talk going on. Yeah, rabbi's talking about the kingdom of God. In the other ear, he's thinking, this guy has done things that no one has ever done before. And so we read on. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. <laughs> Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and day, all night, excuse me, and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. You want to know how much, how influential Jesus was? That's the first miracle right there. A non-fisherman telling a fisherman to go fish when he hasn't caught anything all night and the fisherman goes and does it. That's a certified miracle right there. Fishing. <laughs> the sport of lore. You know that wonderful Chinese wisdom, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. I think it's better put this way, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach him how to fish, and he'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. <laughs> or, as one person who probably could benefit from some marriage counseling wrote, give a man a fish, he's, he has food for a day, teach him how to fish, and you can get, him, get rid of him for the entire weekend. <laughs> and so they start to fish, of all things. And then something happens Peter wasn't expected. When they had done so, verse 6, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. That happens every time I go fishing, by the way, I just want you to know. Their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they, be they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And so here, once again, I don't want you to read this as some type of nice order little, little thing that's happening. I want you to read chaos. I want you to sense panic. They've never seen this many fish before. Their nets are tearing and their boats are beginning to sink. They're doing everything possible to keep those boats afloat while at the same time drag in those fish. It's one thing for a rabbi to be talking about the kingdom in rabbi talk. It's a whole nother thing for a rabbi to fill their boats with a fortune. These weren't just fish. This was life-changing fish. This was more fish than Peter would catch any day or any night. Who knows how long Peter could have lived off this catch of fish. Who knows how this catch of fish might change Peter's life. Perhaps the money from this fish would allow him to go out and actually buy his own boat so he didn't have to lease it from that crook down the lane that caused him to pay more than he should have to get out on the lake and fish. This is life-changing fish. Are you with me? And so Peter's doing everything possible, brings his partners in to get as much of this fish as possible into those boats so their lives can be changed because of the blessings that have come from this rabbi who told them to go fish. And so you ask yourself the question, what would you be most interested in in this event? Peter just won the fish lottery. Verse 8, when, Peter, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. <laughs> Go away from me? Are you kidding me? I think the response ought to be, Hey, Jesus, can you come back tomorrow and do the same thing? Let's do this again. This is great. <laughs> that would be my response. I'd like to win the lottery again, Jesus. Go away from me, Lord. This reminds me so much of the encounters of some of the heroes of the Old Testament. It reminds me of, of Moses' experience after he recognizes he's in the very presence of God and he hides his face because he's afraid. It reminds me of the experiences of Isaiah and Ezekiel as they realize they are in the very presence of the living God themselves. Go away from me. 
And then he uses this word, this title, Lord. It's a different word than what's used up in the previous verse where he calls him master. You and I would know that this word was a common title that was used for people with power or authority, something like a sir kind of experience. But in this case, it really makes me wonder if Peter isn't foreshadowing that after the resurrection, in fact, Jesus would be known as Lord, and not just Lord in the sense of sir, but Lord in the sense of one who has authority over every arena of life. Peter uses the word here to mean much more than sir. And then he says, I am a sinful man. I don't think Peter believes he stepped into the confessional to confess his individual sins here. Rather, he is expressing an overarching sense of unworthiness in the presence of divine power. Once again, Peter's reaction is similar to what we see in Isaiah, is it not? In Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah realizes he's in the very presence of God, he cries out, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh, Elohim. The Apostle John describes a similar reaction when in the very presence of God he writes, When I saw Him, I fell at His feet as though dead. Go away from me, Lord. Go away from me, for I am a sinful man. And surely we we don't know at this point what Peter's understanding of the identity of Jesus will be. We do know as the gospel unfolds, Peter moves in and out of faith with mo- at moments having incredible insight into the presence of Christ and at other moments being completely clueless. At this point, however, it is clear that Peter believes he is in the presence of God. And if not in the presence of God, in the presence of a divine agent of God. And he realizes that in the presence of God, he has no chance. He is in the presence of a power that could snuff him out as quickly as it could fill two boats with fish. He is in the presence of someone with authority that terrifies him. Because that same authority that commanded those fish to jump into that boat could command the demons of hell to destroy him. Go away from me, Lord. I don't care about these fish. I don't care about what they mean or they might mean in changing my life. Go away from me. I am a sinful man. And Jesus responds in the second half of verse 10. Don't be afraid, Peter. Don't be afraid. It's the same language that was used by the angels when they appeared to Zechariah and to Mary when they were terrified being in the presence of the divine. It's what Jesus says to the disciples when they see Him walking to them on the water and are not sure whether they're seeing a ghost. Remember that story? Jesus is walking toward the boat. The disciples don't know who it is. They cry out, it's a ghost. He says, take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. In other words, Jesus is giving Peter to be permission to be in the very presence of the divine. What a powerful image, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then Jesus says something to Peter that I think was just as enigmatic for him as it is for you and for me. He says, from now on you will fish for people. Verse 11, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And so we ask the question, why? Why would Peter, James, and John walk away from the fish lottery? Why would they walk away from life-changing wealth? Why would they walk away from what they had sought to gain their entire lives? 
Why would they leave it? You know what the even more telling question is? Why would we even ask that question? (laughs) Why would we even wonder? If we had the same vision of who Jesus is that Peter had had, how could he not leave everything and follow him? Unfortunately, the New Testament contains stories that aren't quite the same as this one. In fact, we read in other parts of the New Testament that there were those who didn't want to follow Jesus. And so, lest we think that all's just as it ought to be, let's look at those passages as well. Turn to Luke chapter 9, if you would. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read the entire passage starting in verse 57, but I, I feel like this, this passage ought to be like a package of cigarettes. It ought to come with a warning. It says, it reads like this, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This passage is both confounding and disturbing. It challenges what we think we know about Jesus. It challenges what we think we know about being a follower of Christ. It's one of those passages that I wish Marcion had succeeded in cutting out of the New Testament. The first encounter begins with an eager follower. None of these are named. We assume that they were men. He expresses his desire to follow Jesus wherever he may go. And in Matthew 8, 18, we read that he is a scribe. He addresses, te- he addresses Jesus as teacher. This man wants to learn from Jesus. He wants to become his student in the rabbinic tradition. This relationship would have likely meant that the student would live with Jesus. He wanted to sit at his feet. He wanted to walk with him. He wanted to eat with him. He wanted to gain from him. He wanted to learn from him. And what's wrong with that? Jesus replies to him, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Although this man has a worthy desire, Jesus warns him that he does not know what it means to follow Jesus. Rather than the safe and secure image and the honor of being associated with this great teacher, what Jesus is actually offering him is the life of a homeless man, wandering with less than even a fox or a bird has. Jesus envisions no security and no honor to learn from him as his disciple. No society values the homeless, none. A drifter without roots, no identity, no security, nowhere to turn to when trouble comes, no place to protect oneself from the elements. In the ancient world, a man was despised and assumed to be a thief if he was a homeless wanderer. My wife and I lived in Europe for a number of years, and for many of those years we were traveling into parts of Europe that were then known as Eastern Europe, the Soviet bloc. And in Romania in particular, we often encountered a group of people known as the Roma. You may know them by the derogatory term gypsy. The Roma are a landless people, homeless people. They live wherever they want, they move wherever they want, they speak a language that's their own, they have their own legal code, they take care of their own, they move from place to place, they beg, 
and the basic understanding of the Roma everywhere I've been in Europe is that they are all thieves. Parents would warn children, if you see the Roma coming, please run home as quickly as possible because it was assumed they would kidnap those children and take them as their own. The citizens of those lands where the Roma roam, quite frankly, hated them. No social honor, no social identity that was a part of the political systems of the day. No one would say, I want my boy to grow up and marry a Roma. I don't think it was any different in the first century. Jesus is inviting this man to a life that is so different than the life he thought he would get from Jesus that it's almost incomprehensible to imagine what he's asking him to become. Well, that one's bad enough. It's about to get worse. Jesus will say to his disciples later on, that he will be despised and hated by the world, and that those who choose to follow him will also be despised and hated by the world. He says in John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. It's crying out to the Lord now, mercy, Lord, let that be the last verse like that that I ever read. And then we get to verse 59. In verse 59, we read this second encounter, another man. He said to another man, notice, this is a little different encounter because Jesus speaks directly to this man. The first man said, I'm going to follow you, and Jesus says, you don't have a clue what that means. Then he turns to the second man, and he says, follow me. And when he says, follow me, the man replies, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus' reply to this man is harsh, it's stark, it's unyielding. If I could borrow Philip Yancey's phrase, that's the Jesus I never do. So what I want to happen in all this is when the guy says, Lord, please let me go and bury my father, what I want Jesus to say is, okay, let me think about that. You know, I really feel your pain. I'm empathizing with you. Uh, What I want Jesus to do is sit down and say, tell me about your childhood. Are you having separation issues with your father? But what, what I want Jesus to say is, I understand. I understand that according to the law, it's your responsibility to honor your father and mother even in their death. I understand that what you're wanting to do is live out a life that is socially acceptable. That's what everybody assumes I should do or you should do. I get that. And he says something that is completely contrary to what I want him to say. He says, let the dead bury their dead. Commentators have done a wonderful job trying to help us wiggle out of this one. Some talk about the let the dead bury their dead is actually metaphoric. He's talking about let those who do not have the life that is ours in the kingdom bury those who do not have life in the kingdom. Let those who are spiritually dead bury those who are physically dead. Let other people take care of that. Perhaps that's the case. Others have tried to tell us that there were, in fact, two burials that occurred in the first century world. There was the original burial, and then after the decomposition of the body, the bones would be exhumed and put into an ossuary, and there was a second burial. And so, really, what Jesus is talking about here is not the first burial, but the second burial. Regardless of which of the above is true, If you are not shocked and offended by what Jesus said, you are not hearing this with first century ears. In essence, Jesus is saying, let the matter take care of itself. Do not give yourself to things less valuable than the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead, Jesus says, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Let these matters be taken care of, what matters to you. Is what is happening through me. Jesus relentlessly presses on. So he goes to the next the next person comes and or 
he turns to the next person and he says, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family, verse 61. That seems reasonable enough. This guy's not asking for an extended vacation. He's simply asking to go back and take care of his family, to say goodbye to his family. And once again, I, I, I'm, I'm saying, okay, Jesus, it's time for you to put on your mercy hat, and it's time for you to enter into this person's life and understand what, they, what it is they're asking to do. They're not asking for much. Yeah, I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and go say goodbye to your family, and we'll meet around on the other side of this valley in a couple of days. Wouldn't that be reasonable? It's okay to talk back. I mean, I guarantee you, no one is going to assume you're Pentecostals. I guarantee you. So, wouldn't that be reasonable? Of course it's reasonable. Go back, say goodbye to your family. Let them know where you're going to be, that everything's going to be okay. Go back and say it. It's going to be all right. A couple days we'll meet up, and then we'll take care of God's business. And Jesus says to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Wow. I, I have actually plowed a field with an animal. I suspect there aren't a lot of us remaining. My uncle had a donkey, and he used to plow his garden with a, with a donkey. And when I was a city boy, I grew up in a city of 3,000. When I would come and the city boy would be there, he'd say, here, plow this field. So he'd hand me the reins of the donkey, and I'd do my best to plow the field. Now, this donkey had been plowing this field for, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years. It was a very experienced donkey. He knew that field. And so it should have been easy to plow that field with a donkey, but if you know anything about a donkey, they don't really care what they've done the last time they did this. They're going to do what they want to do right now. So I'm trying to plow the field with this donkey, and the truth is, if you aren't looking dead ahead, if you haven't spotted out exactly where you want that donkey to go, and if you aren't applying just the right pressure of where that donkey ought to go, and surely they were using oxen at this point, but I'm talking about a donkey, then you are not going to plow that field in such a way that the field will yield its maximum harvest. My uncle was a little bit of a, he had this kind of this well, it's kind of like my sense of humor. And so what he would do, he knew that the only way to get the donkey into the barn was to hang a carrot out the window. And when that donkey saw that carrot, there is nowhere else that donkey was going than into the barn. So I'm trying to plow the field. What do you think my uncle does? <laughs> Jesus says to this guy, hey, you want to plow a field with an animal? You can't be looking behind you because you will not get that field plowed. And notice what he says, anyone who looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. How would you like to hear Jesus say that to you? Are we appropriately uncomfortable yet? Now listen to me, Jesus is not saying to you and to me that we need to act irresponsibly in relationship to our families, but what Jesus is saying to you and me, that nothing must matter more to us than the kingdom of God, nothing. It is clear from the New Testament that there are times when disciples will fail. And it is clear in the New Testament that Jesus will restore them. Peter is that best known example. This life that Jesus is calling these disciples to is a hard life. It is a life that dis demonstrates a disdain for the values and mores of the world around them and places the values and purpose of the kingdom above everything else. It is a life that will, in fact, separate disciples 
from those who are honored, from those who have wealth, from those who have power, from those who have distinction, and it will place these disciples in a way of life that no one else on the planet would call an abundant life. Yet that's exactly what it is because it's the life that Jesus has called us to. Our good friend Daryl Bach has written, for Jesus, discipleship is serious business and an all-consuming priority in terms of the constancy of one's allegiance. Another commentator has written, following Him is not a task which is added to others like working a second job. It is everything. It is a solemn commitment which forces the disciples to be to reorder all their other responsibilities. None of this makes sense. None of it makes sense without a clear vision of the one that is calling us to that life. Who is this Jesus who demands that kind of devotion, who demands that kind of sacrifice? Think with me. Who is the one that's called us to this life, this abundant life that no one else in the world would call abundant? The one who calls us is the eternal God made flesh, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the image of the invisible God. He is creator and sustainer of the universe, the one in whom we have life and breath. He directs all of human history to the conclusion that He is already ordained. He is the crucified King, the Messiah, the salvation of God, the bringer of shalom, the promised hope of the world, the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. He is the sinless one who became sin on our behalf and died on a cross, the perfect sacrifice for sin, satisfying the wrath of God. He is the risen one who conquered sin and evil in death, and He reigns on high over all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or authorities, and He alone is worthy of honor and praise. Amen. He is the one before whom every knee will bow and before whom every voice will confess one phrase. What is it? Jesus Christ is Lord. So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus enough? Yes. Is He enough for us to pursue a life of abundance that the world thinks is foolishness? Is He enough for us to give up all of our rootedness and pursue a life of homelessness? He is. He is the Christ of our abundance. And we find life only in Him. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, when you and I step into and live into a world that is dead and blind and dying and oppressive, and evil, and hates you, and hates your Savior, the only reason to keep bringing life, and announcing life, and living life in that world is because Jesus is worth it. He's enough. Let's pray. And so we thank you, our Father. Oh, for your son, oh, we want you to know how singularly unworthy we are. 
and how worthy your Son is. In Him we come to you. And we ask that you would strip away the scales that have been placed on our eyes by the culture of death in which we live, by the deception of the one who blinds us to his glory and that we would see, in fact, who is the one we name as Savior, the risen King, our Lord Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen.